star-crossed love between an elf and a human, a wizard-like stranger, and a world-destroying oath. The Rings of Power is filled with subtle details only true fans will recognize. Spoilers ahead. It doesn't take long for subtle references to start showing up in the Rings of Power. In fact, there's one that appears during the show's prologue. As Galadriel narrates about her fallen brother, Finrod Felagund, we see his corpse lying on a table under a cloth. His arms are out, and his flesh is scarred with numerous wounds. The video highlights one of these cuts specifically, the mark that Sauron puts on him. Sauron's brand isn't canon. In the source material, the Dark Lord doesn't go around burning a sign into people's flesh, but he does leave quite a few marks on the heroic Finrod. In the Silmarillion, Finrod helps the heroes Baron and Luthien in their quest to reclaim one of the titular hallowed jewels called the Silmarils. In the process, he and his companions are captured by Sauron. The villain, who isn't the Dark Lord yet, kills off the group one at a time using werewolves. As one of the werewolves makes for Baron, Finrod uses all of his power to defeat it, though his wounds were mortal. Those scratches aren't from a scrape in battle. They're not from swords or spears or arrows. Those are bona fide dying werewolf wounds. Another Easter egg tucked into the early moments of the Rings of Power appears when several elves draw their swords together in quick succession. For fans familiar with Tolkien's lore, the scene immediately brings to mind the famous Oath of Feanor from the Silmarillion. Galadriel's brother Finrod is amongst them, which is out of place considering the source material, but otherwise everything lines up. The event, while skimmed over in the prologue of the show, is a watershed moment in Middle-earth history. The oath is taken by the famous elvish character Feanor and his seven sons. It's an irrevocable oath that leads to a lot of tragedy. And if it is the oath of Feanor, then Finrod shouldn't be there. But the setting and actions, however briefly they're depicted, seems to be a direct nod toward the oath that is so critical to the stories that follow. The Rings of Power doesn't have access to the Silmarillion, which is probably why its prologue is so quick and nonspecific. It skims over many of the major events that take place in that book. Some are easy to spot, like the Oath of Feanor. Others seem to be a murky mashup of multiple events presented at the same time, including a series of battles and violent conflicts. These start with a shot of a dragon throwing a giant eagle to the ground in a blaze of fire. This is an event that could have only happened during the earth-shattering, age-ending War of Wrath right before the Rings of Power starts. That's the battle where Morgoth, the first Dark Lord, is finally defeated. When Galadriel picks up a helmet and puts it into a gigantic pile of other helmets, the scene calls another battle to mind. One of the most tragic events of the first stage of Middle-earth's history is called the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. After the battle which goes badly for the army of elves, a giant mountain of bodies is created called the Hill of the Slain. While it isn't quite the same thing as a bunch of helmets, the feel of Galadriel's sorrowful experience in the aftermath of the unnamed battlefield seems to hint at that famously tragic event. In Peter Jackson's extended edition of The Fellowship of the Ring, Galadriel sails a swan boat in Lothlorien. In The Rings of Power, we see Galadriel sailing to Valinor in a boat with a similar bird-like prow. In the opening scene of the show, a young Galadriel also makes a paper boat that doesn't just float, it sails. And as it does so, its wings, neck, and head pop up in glorious fashion. Without going too overboard on details, one group of elves that lives in Valinor is called the Tellery. They mostly dwell in a place called Alqualanda, which loosely translates to the Haven of the Swans. The Silmarillion explains that the Teleri ships were made to look like swans with golden beaks and eyes. Much later in the book, it explains how the elves visited the island nation of Numenor too, saying, And thence at times the firstborn still would come sailing to Numenor, in oarless boats as white birds flying from the sunset. From the get-go, bird-shaped boats, and especially swan-shaped boats, are a trademark of elvish maritime activity. When Galadriel and her company set sail for Valinor in the first episode of The Rings of Power, they arrive at a foggy, rainy sea, 
As the clouds roll back, it slowly reveals a glorious, blinding light which all of the elves but Galadriel willingly enter into. This isn't necessarily how the process of elves leaving Middle-earth looks in the books, but there's a lot left open to interpretation. As far as small details are concerned, there's one specific aspect that is worth calling out. Twice in The Lord of the Rings, Frodo experiences arriving in the Blessed Realm. In the books, the first time is in a dream in the Fellowship of the Ring. The second time is when he sails there at the end of The Return of the King. The book describes Frodo's experience beautifully. And then it seemed to him that, as in his dream in the House of Bombadil, the grey rain curtain turned all to silver glass and was rolled back. And he beheld white shores and beyond them a far green country under a swift sunrise. We may not see Valinor in the scene from the Rings of Power, but we do see a grey rain curtain and it rolls back as they approach. When we first meet the Harfoots in the Rings of Power, they're running circles around a couple of wary hunters. The little people lay low and avoid being seen without any issues. As the big folk move along, one of the Harfoots blows a whistle of sorts to signal the coast is clear. This moment might bring another incident to mind, a time when Theoden, King of Rohan, has a conversation with a couple of hobbits in Isengard in the Two Towers. Merry, Pippin, and Theoden all bond over the fact that their ancestors came from the same area of the world, an area close to where the Harfoots currently live when the Rings of Power begins. In the discussion, Theoden mentions that the halflings in the apocryphal stories have some interesting skill sets. He adds that they can vanish in a twinkling. In addition, he says, they can change their voices to resemble the piping of birds. While that is clearly an exaggeration, it would appear that the Rings of Power writers may be hinting at how that legend came about. The Harfoots of the Rings of Power and the Hobbits of later stories may be distantly related, but there are a lot of differences that set them apart, not the least of which is the fact that one group lives a wandering nomadic lifestyle and the others settle in undisturbed, domesticated comfort. Even so, some of the through lines are already visible, even when the setting is so different. Harfoots are already shown with a very healthy appetite for good food. When Nori leads a group of youngsters to a berry patch, their affinity for food is on full display. Interestingly, the scene also offers a parallel to the last pages of The Return of the King. In that book, Tolkien explains in the aftermath of the War of the Ring, the Shire thrives once Sauron is defeated. The text says, The fruit was so plentiful that young hobbits very nearly bathed in strawberries and cream, and later they sat on the lawns under the plum trees and ate until they had made piles of stones like small pyramids or the heaped skulls of a conqueror, and then they moved on. In the first episode of The Rings of Power, there's a point when Marigold Brandyfoot has a serious talk with Nori about her adventurous behavior. The halfling mother breaks down how the world works for the younger, less experienced Nori. Elves have forests to protect, dwarfs their mines, mend their fields of grain. She continues that the trees have to worry about the soil beneath them, but she says, we Harfoots are free from the worries of the wide world. It leaves Nori squirming, but doesn't put a dent in her desire for adventure. But it also may be the first time in the series that Tolkien's Ents enter the conversation. The Ents are referred to at different times as the Shepherds of the Trees. In the Silmarillion, the Ents are explicitly made as a way to guard trees against other creatures that may want to harm them. The presence of Ents in the Rings of Power is established later in the episode. They make a quick cameo when the meteor streaks overhead and three Ents are shown moving amongst the trees. When Galadriel returns home from her long pursuit of Sauron, the High King Gil-galad is convinced to welcome her as a hero. Despite her rebellious disregard of his orders, the King puts on a celebration to rival the likes of Bilbo's 111th birthday party. As the elves party in Linden, the sky lights up with fireworks that take on many different shapes. Some swirl, while others look like flowers. One even takes on the distinct shape of a butterfly and flaps its wings. 
The Fellowship of the Ring describes Gandalf's fireworks at Bilbo's party by saying they included singing bird sounds, trees losing their leaves, eagles, sailing ships, and much more. It also has the line, there were fountains of butterflies that flew glittering into the trees. Of course, the question of who's better at the craft of making fireworks is something that would have to be solved with a head-to-head -head contest between the wizard and the elves, but alas, it's a competition we'll never get to see. After Gladriel discovers that she's going to be shipped back home to Valinor, she retreats to a peaceful area of the Linden Forests where Elrond finds her, and the two characters proceed to have a long talk. As they chant, they're surrounded by a string of very elvish-looking lamps and a series of statues carved right into living trees. One of these statues depicts Gladriel's brother Finrod, who is a first-stage hero, but several others appear as well. We're willing to guess that at least one is the human first-stage hero Turin Turambar. There are plenty of candidates for who the others could be, but there's one statue whose identity is without question. At one point, the camera flashes past a living wooden statue of a woman with long, flowing hair and a shaggy dog in front of her. There's no doubt that this is an image of the immortal maiden Luthien and the dog Huan. Luthien is one of the iconic heroines of Tolkien's world. She was inspired by the author's wife, and Luthien's name was even put on her gravestone. She's known for her hair and also happens to be Elrond's great-grandmother. The dog, Huan, is also the greatest wolfhound in Middle-earth history. He talks multiple times and even defeats Sauron in a duel. When the stranger crash lands near the Harfoots, Nori and Poppy try to take care of him. This ends up being more difficult than it seems because the fellow initially acts like a child. He can't even talk and doesn't know how to take care of himself. For those who know Tolkien, this seems to point very heavily toward the stranger being a wizard. Apart from the fact that he's supernaturally powerful, the whole infantile start to his Middle-earth tenure points to his wizarding origins. In the book Unfinished Tales, Tolkien's son Christopher brought together most of his father's notes about the wizards, or Istari as they're called in Elvish. In that collection of facts, it says, For it is said in deed, that being embodied, the Istari had need to learn much anew by slow experience. And though they knew whence they came, the memory of the blessed realm was to them a vision from afar off, for which they yearned exceedingly. If the stranger is a wizard, it would make sense that after his arrival, he would need to relearn some basic things like talking and eating. Add on to that the fact that he knows a few things like constellations. Who is the stranger from the Rings of Power? As Nori and Poppy wrangle their mysterious, powerful friend, they slowly gain clues about who he is. By the end of the second episode, he manages to communicate by using fireflies to form the shape of a constellation in the sky. Nori gets excited when she realizes that he wants to find a similar shape of actual stars. During this scene, there's also a small easter egg that calls back to Peter Jackson's films. When Ian McKellen's Gandalf is trapped on top of Isengard, he catches a moth and whispers a message to it in unintelligible language. The Stranger talks to the Fireflies in a very similar manner in The Rings of Power. This could signal a direct connection between the characters. Could the Stranger be Gandalf? It could also simply be a magical behavior that they're both displaying. This could be meant to showcase how both characters are wizards or at least have a similar spiritual power that enables them to talk directly to animals. Whatever the answer, the way the stranger chats up the fireflies looks so similar to Gandalf's discussion with the moth, it's difficult to think it's anything less than a direct easter egg. When Elrond arrives in Eregion in the second episode of The Rings of Power, he hits things off with Lord Celebrimbor, whose craftsmanship he's greatly admired from afar. As they get to know one another, they talk about crafting a hammer on display in Celebrimbor's workshop. It's not just any hammer. It used to belong to the master elven craftsman Feanor. While the show makes that fact clear, the quiet context left out of the dialogue is that Celebrimbor likely has the hammer because he's Feanor's grandson. The little details don't stop there. As the conversation carries on, the two elves look at plans to build a giant, overheated new addition to Celebrimbor's workshop. 
the elven master craftsman says that he wants to build a tower that could hold the most powerful forge ever constructed in Middle Earth, one that would burn as hot as a dragon's tongue. The subtle reference brings to mind a line from The Fellowship of the Ring, where Gandalf says, It has been said that dragon fire could melt and consume the rings of power, but there is not now any dragon left on Earth in which the old fire is hot enough. The reference to a forge as hot as a dragon's tongue is a fitting description because chances are Celebrimbor has plans to use his new forge to create the rings of power. When Elrond and Celebrimbor head over to Khazad Doom to recruit the help of the dwarves, the Lord of Region informs his companion that he's always admired the dwarves and wonders if he'll be able to see them at work in their forges. Elrond sets some rather lofty expectations in response, pointing out that he thinks they'll do a lot more than that. He launches into a description of dwarven hospitality that includes blaring ram's horns, tables full of salted pork, and lots and lots of malt beer. If the depiction sounds familiar, it's because Gimli talks about the same kind of dwarven welcome thousands of years later during The Lord of the Rings. In The Fellowship of the Ring, as Frodo and company enter Moria, Gimli warns Legolas to prepare for the fabled hospitality of the dwarves, adding what the elf should expect to find waiting for him. Roaring fires, malt beer, red meat off the bone. Tying these references together creates some continuity between the two distinctly different versions of Middle-earth. Both may be their own adaptations, but when it comes to dwarven hospitality, everyone's on the same page. The dwarves have an interesting creation story. Unlike men and elves who are created by the godlike supreme being Iluvatar, dwarves are initially formed by the angelic being Aule. Though he makes them, Aule can't give his dwarves sentient life. That's something only Iluvatar can do. And he eventually gets around to it. Even so, the dwarves always have a special affinity for Aule, and it shows in the Rings of Power. In the rock-breaking scene, Durin IV references his semi-maker when he describes the event as the dwarven test of endurance, fashioned by Aule himself. Later on, when Durin and Elrond are arguing, Disa expresses her disapproval by referencing Aule's beard. For most viewers, it's a random and odd name. For Tolkien fans, it's a clear and well-placed reference to the greatest being in all of dwarven culture and history. It's also worth pointing out that the full dwarven face masks worn by many of the guards of Khazad Doom get their inspiration from the Silmarillion. At one point, the dwarves take on a bunch of dragons, which they can do because of their hideous but nearly indestructible masks. It's a one-off reference, and it's fun to see the famous headgear translated into the garb of Durin's guards. When we first meet Arondir in the Southlands of Middle-earth, he's visiting a town of men with a fellow elven warden. While there, he interacts with the human woman Bronwyn, and it's clear that the two are in love. As they leave, Arondir and his fellow elf verbally spar. Eventually, the talk turns more serious, and Arondir's companion says, My point is this. Only twice in known history has a pairing between elves and humans even been attempted, and on each occasion, it ended in tragedy. It ended in death. The reference is to two distinct pairings. The first is the mortal man, Baron, and the immortal Luthien. They get hitched and end up dying twice. The other pair is the man, Tuor, and the elf maiden, Idril. While they have a happier ending, their tale is also filled with some epic and tragic events. <laughs>